Thanks very much, Elena. Uh, yeah, as Elena said, so I'm the service lead for policy, performance and community planning at South Ayrshire. Uh, within that job title somewhere was my previous and initial role, which was housing policy and strategy manager. So that's why this is quite relevant to, to what we're talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm planning to talk about today is really how I got involved in this, how it started uh, for, for me and how that's then influenced how, how we can uh, uh, approach things in South Ayrshire. The things we've done, how it's going, uh, the kind of feedback we're getting and, and what we're trying to achieve. What's next in that uh, in that journey for us as a local authority? Also try and cover some of the kind of issues and barriers that we've faced along the way. And then I'm happy to take questions, obviously, as a, as a panel session a bit further on. Uh, but if people just post their questions uh, in the bar, I'm happy to answer them. Next slide, please. So for me, the, my, my first interaction, my first real experience uh, with kind of trauma-informed uh, agenda was the resilience documentary, which Police Scotland uh, in, in Ayrshire, where I, I managed to get the, the rights to and had a copy of it and were putting on screenings at every possible opportunity. So I just happened to be at an event where they put on the, the screening of resilience. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's based in America, but it really focuses on the adverse childhood experiences and the influence that they can have in later life. And that really got me thinking as to, well, you know, they, they come up with the studies that show the amount of ACEs. I know it's not always how we look at things, but, you know, the likelihood of them involved with substance misuse and uh, homelessness, etc. So I thought this was something really worth exploring and started doing a wee bit more digging. I came across the, the Scottish Trauma Informed Leaders Training uh, from NHS Education Scotland. And it was actually Caroline who was, who was uh, training that day. So it was the very first one that had been uh, pulled together. And I was there with a lot of a widespread group of people uh, from dentists to police to NHS to social work. And I was there. I think I was the only housing person there. But it was it was absolutely fascinating. And it was a real game changer for me. Uh, you know, it really changed how, how I viewed the world. It gave me this trauma-informed lens, that, which I've never had before, and I suppose answered a lot of questions I maybe had internally that I'd never really, never really brought forward or, or never really been able to, to uh, articulate properly, and really got me thinking about how this, this could impact in, on the way we work. So for me, I, I began to realise quite quickly there was a, a lot of big benefits to, to, to a trauma-informed approach. Firstly, uh, we can really, really improve the service we offer to our customers by doing this. We've got so much data around our customers, but we don't really have that intelligence to follow that up. And to me, understanding trauma and understanding how that can then reflect in people's uh, behaviours and how they present and how they interact with services really gave us that extra bit of intelligence and how we could help design services to, to, to better meet people's needs. Secondly, I thought it was a real opportunity uh, to to move forward with the prevention agenda. I think too often some of our services and the way we've delivered services in the past push people away. You know, it's not as prevalent as it, as it, as it, as it previously has been, but the kind of three strikes and you're out, or we've, we've tried you and you never get back to it. So you're then, all we're doing is pushing people further away from, from our services when we do that. And really the reality is then the next time we see them is going to be a crisis, whether it's a, uh, housing options or homelessness or it's the uh, A&E or it's the GP and really if we, if we want to try and keep that relationship going with people and keep that engagement then the more trauma informed we are the less likely we are to, to push people away. Thirdly I thought in terms of how we can improve our interactions internally with each other and, and trying to understand uh, you know if we're looking to collaborate and then having a better understanding of, of what's going on in people's life is one of the, the sayings and one of the, the, the phrases that really stuck with me is trauma is everyone's business and understanding the prevalence of it, understanding that it, it's not just the service users or the people that we work with, it's actually in, within our organisation, it's within our households, you know, it's, 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 it's prevalent within society. And so to understand it better means we can work together better. Also, I think there's a big role for that in terms of the sort of vicarious trauma that a lot of our staff maybe go through from a day-to-day -day basis sitting doing housing options interviews you know five or six a day is you know mentally and psychologically exhausting and i think that uh, we need to have a better understanding of the impact that has on people and that can multiply through a, a number of different council services 
uh, and, and, and other RSL services, etc. So I think that's really important to understand. But more important, out of all of this, I think it was also, to me, it was a great way to just bring that wee bit of humanity back into the system, especially a housing system that's so driven by <clears throat> uh, data and numbers and, uh, you know, kind of output. Sometimes I think the humanity and what we do is lost, and that's certainly no criticism of, of, of the people involved in the sector, because I'm one of those people, and, you know, the way, we're, the way, we're, the way we report, the way things uh, are, are, are driven, it can be easy to lose that humanity sometimes and you know people get exhausted by it and people get that you know compassion fatigue and so it's to me i thought it was a really uh, good potential way to bring that back into the system and make sure it's at the heart of what we're doing uh, so when i got to that it's basically what next what do i do next i've got this this new information i've got this trauma informed lens how do i how do i make it happen uh, next slide please so I went looking for training, uh, but as I was lucky enough to be part of the very first pilot, the very first uh, project uh, for the stilt training, it also meant there was no real resources around it based on the, 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 the trauma from a uh, tier system. So we were really quite frustrated with all this uh, enthusiasm and I managed to build up a bit of enthusiasm amongst my team about it as well, but we had nowhere really to go on it. So we were very lucky to have a, a, an ADP coordinator, Faye Murphy, uh, and a clinical psychologist who also one day a week was responsible for, for promoting the framework and also within my team, Emma Douglas. And basically we got it together and we managed to produce our own training, which was uh, <clears throat> aimed at trauma skilled level two and was to be rolled out one amongst uh, people who wanted it in the ADP and, and, and the Health and Social Group Partnership, but from our point of view in a more focused version uh, for, for a particular service area. Next slide, please. So for me, the first thing we had to do is I really wanted to, we had the training, uh, we had enthusiasm amongst myself and my team, but I really wanted to get that enthusiasm uh, amongst the other partners in the council. So we held a, a leadership engagement event and that was bringing in uh, elected members, it was bringing in senior uh, management and basically, I think you can maybe just make out the screen there, that's the uh, opening doors animation we were shown, that was, that was well received. So we did a, a few different inputs from people. We had James Doherty from the Violence Reduction Unit, which I'm sure many of you heard speaking, fantastic, and it was, you know, it really captivated the audience. We then had a panel session uh, with our Champions Board, with James, with Faith from the ADP, and, and discussion around trauma. So I think we managed to build that momentum that we were really, uh, really looking for, and that gave us the, the sort of the tacit permission to go and, to go and pursue this as, a, as an idea within the council, not just within housing services, within that wider council. Next slide, please. So, while well, Faith team were doing the training and we were getting trainers trained, and basically that was a kind of first come, first serve basis, we also did a, another element which was focused on a particular service. So, we focused on the housing options service to, to go through our, 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 our training, and we took kind of four stages to this. First of all, we uh, had a self-evaluation prior to the training. That was based on the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service admin uh, self-evaluation that had been produced, and we adapted it slightly uh, to, to make it more relevant to what we were doing. But what this looked at is you know, trying to get grasp people's knowledge of trauma from the start, the supervision and support and self-care that was available within the organisation, the physical environment and how services were delivered, and also the sort of service user involvement in what we do. Uh, and, uh, so some really interesting things came out of that from the start. A lot of people were unaware the role that traumatic, traumatic stress played. A lot of people didn't think that the, the environment that we offered at other services was quite right, especially for children. Uh, and also there were there was a, 44 percent of, of the staff are unaware of, of how we can then impact on traumatic stress uh, in a negative way if we don't deliver services quite how we, how, how we plan to. So then we had the trauma skilled uh, practice training which was really really positive, really well received. The, the training uh, has a lot of focus on self-care which I think is really important and there's a lot of interaction and a lot of positive feedback uh, after it. After that we moved into to focus groups. Now the focus group we're split into service users, staff and management and sort of coordinator level. So each one of those uh, service, those focus groups, we did what we call chips and chat nights. We basically, if you come and speak to us, we'll, we'll buy you a fish supper and you can sit and chat about, about the experiences of a service and the, the, similar applied to, to the staff groups who come in. They were really, really interesting. So we based them around the five principles, uh, trust, safety, collaboration, power and choice. And I think what really stood out for me is the, the sort of different perceptions that each, each group had 
on what those words meant to them, whether it be service users, whether it be staff, or whether it be management. Actually, there was a real difference in what and how they interpreted those those things. So that was really interesting. A lot of really uh, good service improvement ideas for us. Those those sessions. Then we went on to to repeat the self evaluation to see how our staff felt they'd moved on. And again, we felt we were getting what we wanted out of it. We were getting really good feedback. We were getting uh, that that uh, enhancement of understanding of what what staff. Uh, what we're doing and the role that they could play in, in, in trauma. Next slide, please. So, has it made a difference? So, certainly the positive feedback from the staff, they, they said they were better equipped to do their job. What, there was initially a bit of reticence, they thought it was another thing they had to do, they had to now be psychologists in what they were doing, when really it, it, it's not that at all. And I think once we go over that barrier, there's a lot of really positive feedback from staff. Changes in practice beginning to already take, take shape. Re-traumatization is a particular focus. We, 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 looked at that we, we realized we're, we're asking some people to tell their story four or five times before they're allocated a, a, a support worker, which is just madness. So we've cut that down, uh, but it's still not great, I've got to say. So that's another area that we're really looking to, to improve. The focus groups were so well received that, uh, that we've been encouraged to continue them. We were already doing from a tenant participation point of view, uh, so to focus on specifically housing options and, and trauma and those five principles uh, of, of trauma-informed practice, uh, we're going to continue to, to, to work with them. Housing support contracts are a real big change, so uh, Kenny and Karen have both talked about uh, you know, that relationship-based stuff, and we're about to re-tender our housing support contracts. And the difference between our last tender in 2017 and this tender is really, really big. It was all about outputs, it was all about that. The support with those practical tasks, now the wording and the language in the tender is much more about relationships and much more about building those. And it's really what the person needs. And Kenny's slide about, you know, no one ever dies for not being able to, to do the dishes. That's exactly, that's a great point. It's really well made because that's exactly what, what we're looking to do as well. It's people don't. Tenancies don't really fail because people didn't know how to pay their bills. It's all the stuff that surrounds that that causes a tenancy to fail. And I think if they can understand that better and support that better, we'll be able to deliver better services. Final slide, please. So what's next for us? So the, the Scottish Government's Trauma Champions have been really positive from my perspective. I'm in the South Ayrshire one. We've also got elected members in there and that's enhanced that elected uh, member buy-in. We are embedding a strategic group within our community planning structures, which is really important. They'll, they'll fall into the strategic delivery partnership for population health. And I think that's really good because it's not just about the council or one part of the council being trauma informed. If we can get that spread through community planning partners, then people's interactions with the system as a whole will be much better and that uh, trusting relationship can be built. We're going to have a member officer group to make sure the members get, get their input into that as well. And also what we're looking to do as part of our uh, changes to our uh, equalities impact assessment. We're looking about how can we bring tra elements of trauma into that as well, so that any new policies that are being evaluated can, can take account uh, of trauma. So I might have went a wee bit over time there, so apologies for that, but uh, that's, that's me and I'm, I had to take any questions.